welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet show offering the latest news and interviews with the people driving business, technology, and politics in Michigan. Now, your hosts, Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. And Matt Rausch. And we have calling in from West Michigan, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. How are you doing today, sir? Good afternoon. Good to talk with you. Yeah, absolutely. As some of you may be aware that he's writing a quarterly column for us, and so that column has been posted to MI Tech News, and that's what we're going to dig into in this podcast. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that column. Now, uh, you were talking about uh, the connected, autonomous, shared, and electric are the really themes for mobility as far as you and Governor Whitmer are concerned, right? That's right. I mean, we're, what we're talking about is, really laying the foundation for the future of mobility in the state of Michigan, building upon our history, but also charging forward with innovations based on those four principles. You know, our our community needs to be more connected and our vehicles and the way we choose to get from point A to point B need to be more connected to one another and to our infrastructure as well. Um, Autonomy, you know, we are moving toward that future, which I think will really present some real opportunities for, for freedom and innovation for people. We're talking about shared, just making sure that we are building infrastructure for transit. Everyone's not going to ride in these vehicles as individuals. We need to have we need to have good business models, good infrastructure to support that kind of sharing. Then on electrification, you know, uh, my personal experience having uh, driven a couple of electric vehicles in my past, but also ensuring how we can make sure that our grid can support this kind of electrification and that more more vehicles in our fleet, whether those are in large vehicles or in personal vehicles, are more electrified so we can lessen our impact on the environment. So with these principles, and we plan to support these principles, um, that's how we're going to move forward to a mobility future. Okay, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I, I, it's Matt Rausch. I just I just wanted to ask you about the infrastructure challenges of full vehicle electrification. I got to thinking about this as I was sitting in an office at Lawrence Tech, looking at the cars in the parking lot and wondering how on earth are we going to put a four hundred and forty foot uh, volt charger in our hundreds of parking spaces? And you know how how is that uh, infrastructure going to come about? Who makes that investment? How is it structured? And how does the grid adapt to that? I think like anything, it's going to be a, a, a question of partnership. It's going to be uh, private industry working with us in government, working with academia and research to really push the envelope about what it will mean to have electrification work on that scale. We also may be looking toward a future that gets beyond plugging in cars individually. I mean, you can imagine um, whether it's inductive charging or other kinds of technologies that are um, the same thing that allows you to charge your cell phone wirelessly. Maybe you can charge your car wirelessly like that at some point in the future. So we shouldn't be limited by the models that we see right now. Um, we should be thinking about how we can push the envelope forward. And thankfully, we have amazing research institutions in the state of Michigan that I know will continue to uh, really press us toward what that future can look like. So uh, the big three, well, of course, we don't call them that anymore. I guess the Detroit three uh, uh, are really pushing electric vehicles going forward. I mean, they really, hybrid was that intermediate step, but they've kind of, I wouldn't say abandoned hybrids, but they're moving from internal combustion to all electric quickly. Um, And is that good for Michigan? Do you think that, are we going to be in the forefront of that whole effort or continue to be in the forefront of that effort? We certainly should press. We certainly should press to do that. I mean, it's another opportunity for the state of Michigan to lead. You know, I, I was the proud owner of a Chevy Bolt, and that was one of the first vehicles that was a plug-in electric hybrid uh, built by a domestic automaker. And now I have a uh, my wife drives a Ford Fusion plug-in hybrid, and so uh, we're proud to support that. And we think that the the domestic automakers are going to continue to push that envelope. And I do think it's a good thing. Whenever Michigan thinkers, Michigan researchers, Michigan workers are building the next generation of vehicles that are pushing the envelope about what it means to be a car, then we are in a good position. All right. As as far as the connected vehicles go, um, I'm just, as a practical matter, uh, what are connected vehicles connected to and, and why is it an improvement that they're, that they're connected? What's the advantage of that technology? So there, they, there's, the connectivity here means a couple of different things potentially. And again, I want to stress that. I'm talking about what exists or what can exist today, not necessarily what can be invented for tomorrow. When we're talking about connecting vehicles to infrastructure, there can be significant safety improvements. So things like if vehicles can be connected to infrastructure and connected to one another, um, one of the things you see a big, uh, you've seen accidents where emergency vehicles are getting into accidents with cars as they're trying to speed to help people 
for experiencing an emergency. Imagine if our vehicles were more connected and such that that emergency vehicle could give out a beacon before one could even hear the siren um, that would let other cars know that there is this vehicle charging through to get to an emergency. The car could then make a different choice about how to get out of the way so that everyone would be safe. We would not have these accidents that put uh, more people in danger. Um, so these connected vehicle to vehicle exchanges are one example. The other ones are vehicle to infrastructure, um, infrastructure information about things like traffic, information about things like road conditions, having infrastructure, the road itself or the street lights or the barriers, being able to communicate with, with vehicles and give the vehicle more information to also handle uh, the roadways more safely. So these are just some of the scenarios that can be enabled. And I think it's important as we move forward to have our cars and our infrastructure be smarter. Yeah, in particular, the cars talking to each other, I can think of a couple of examples of that personally where that would have been very helpful. I was involved years ago in a chain reaction car crash in a whiteout on M72 west of Traverse City where one car just kept plowing into the back of the wreck and, and it you know, plow into the back of the wreck. Here comes another one, bam. Here comes another one, bam. And there was a really bad accident accident on I-94 between Kalamazoo and Battle Creek just a few years ago where that happened. And if you could have told people five or ten miles behind that accident, slow down, there's a really bad accident up here. And as a matter of fact, you probably want to get off the freeway and take a surface road, you know, as an alternative. You know, that's that would be a huge advantage and, and save a lot of lives and property damage. Yeah, safety is a really big, big issue here that I'm not sure actually gets talked about enough when we're talking about the future for connected and autonomous vehicles. I guess this is about technology being inter- interesting and enabling more scenarios, but it is also about just making transportation more safe for more people. And so um, those are the scenarios that we definitely need to optimize first. And in terms of autonomous vehicles, uh, obviously the the Detroit three are very optimistic about how quickly that's going to come to pass. Yeah. I'm a naysayer. Uh, I don't think it's going to come I'm to more pass. of a skeptic, too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's coming but, you know, to think in the next four or five years we're going to get to level four or five or something like that, I think that's overly optimistic. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think um, the future of autonomous vehicles is really exciting here in Michigan. In fact, I'm speaking with you from Western Michigan University right now, where I just got a chance to ride in for the first time in my life to ride in an autonomous vehicle on campus that was designed by Pratt and Miller and other partners as mm. part of uh, this $8 million Michigan, uh, $8 million Michigan mobility challenge that we, um, en- enacted earlier this year. And so I, you know, whether we, what year we get to level four or level five autonomy, I think is not really the question. The question is, how can we make sure that as autonomous vehicles become a bigger part of our vehicle mix, that they're safer, that they're more efficient, um, and that we're designing them and building them here in Michigan. And I'm just proud to see this project get off the ground, this pilot project. And I think we're going to see even more of it from more automakers. Yeah, we've got. Uh, I'm I'm the PR guy at Lawrence Technological University, and uh, we've got a a low speed electric vehicle, one of those 25 mile an hour gem electric vehicles that we have set up as an autonomous vehicle that bops around campus, um, and it's really interesting to see. Um, but it's you know it's basically it's student developed software that powers the thing, so it's it's still early days, but it is exciting to see certainly. Every every, pro- every project had early days. You know, everything starts out like that. But I'm 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 really excited about the just again the innovation that I'm seeing. Um the fact that, you know, something can go from a rough draft like that to a, to full blown products and that's exactly what we need to be doing here in Michigan. Mm-hmm. Another issue is the uh, shared, particularly the urban setting, the shared uh, vehicle environment, um, and what impact that's gonna have on overall manufacturing of automobiles. A lot of the millennials particularly the bigger cities. I know I have friends in Chicago that don't even own cars. I don't think we've come quite that far in Detroit because Chicago has better mass transit. But, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, the shared – how do you feel the shared impact is going to impact Michigan? Well, I think it's important to, that our companies are, are recognizing that what it means to be a transportation company. I, I'm one of those millennials you talked about who uh, – <laughs> did not own a car in the city of Detroit with my wife and my two, and my two uh, baby children for almost three years. So experience using not only public transit, but also uh, ride share and car share services and bikes and really a sort of multimodal 
approach to getting from point A to point B. And I think our, our Michigan trans- transportation companies and auto companies have begun to adapt toward that future. You've seen them make investments in some of the smaller startup companies to be able to be more prepared for that version of the economy and that version of our mobility future. And they're going to continue to innovate in that regard. So um, I am very confident that companies and people in the state of Michigan will be able to adapt and actually design what the future of this economy is going to look like. And shared vehicle ownership and shared vehicle management is going to be a part of it. And that's not something we should be afraid of. Okay. So Detroit never got light rail of the type you see in cities like Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and other places. Um, how can we sort of leapfrog to the next stage of, of uh, mass transit technology if we're not going to spend billions of dollars digging subways or building you know, elevated rail? Well, we need to first focus on partnership. These kinds of uh, transportation solutions um, need to be regional in nature, and that is why uh, I think you're going to see the leadership in southeastern Michigan working in partnership with the state. Um, We're going to work to make sure we have regional transit solutions available, not just for Metro Detroit and southeastern Michigan, but frankly for people all across the state. I'm in the midst right now of a tour called Thriving Cities where we're looking at how we can improve quality of life for people who live in cities. And as far north as Marquette, so earlier today in Battle Creek, Michigan, I heard about the need for regional transportation solutions. So we need to come together as partners first so we can then brainstorm what the solutions of today and tomorrow are going to look like. And they may not look like heavy rail or subway systems the way that it looks in other cities. But we do know that successful transportation systems are regional in nature. I lived in Washington, D.C. for five years and did not own a car for four years and relied on a regional transportation system. Oh, the, the metro is true. Yeah, yeah, the metro is fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so that, that's, but that's an example of a regional transportation system that met the people's uh, needs in cities, suburbs, uh, rural communities alike in metropolitan Washington, D.C. That's the kind of model that we need to, to improve upon here in the state of Michigan. I think we can do it for regions all across the state. And one last one I know is near and dear to the heart of your boss there, Governor Whitmer. Part of what goes on with autonomous vehicles is some of those sensors and whatnot are going to have to be embedded in the roads. And uh, right now we barely have money to fix the roads. So how are we going to solve that problem? We need to invest. We need more money for infrastructure so we can fix and build our roads in the right way, in a way that is forward-looking and that is future-conscious. And so, yes, that means having the roads that we fix and build be smarter. That means having them be connected. That means laying the type of conduit and fiber underneath those roads so we can connect communities, not just in terms of the vehicles that drive on them, but in terms of the broadband Internet connectivity that those vehicles and the people who live in those communities will need. We are ready to invest in that. The budget that we put forward made a courageous generational investment in that. So we are still working and fighting to make sure that these kinds of investments happen in the right way in Michigan. Are you optimistic that uh, you, I've seen both proposals and they're quite different? Uh, is there a meet in the in, in the middle sort of solution? I'm an engineer from Detroit. I'm always optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what else would you like to talk about real briefly here at the end? Well, just I want to thank you all for um, – for just giving me the, the opportunity to be able to contribute uh, uh, by, by submitting the column and connecting with your, your readers and your, your listeners on the podcast. Um, we have a really important opportunity to really define the future uh, starting here in Michigan, and, I, and I'm glad to uh, serve uh, the state in this capacity to be part of it. Additional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs, too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare. 